Welcome back, everybody. Now I'm going to get a chance to talk to Felicity's mom. Okay, fanboy hat off. Uh, welcome to the program, actress, uh, director, and uh, and teacher, Eve Gordon. Welcome, Eve. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, we're going to get to Felicity. Uh, we'll get to Felicity a little bit later. But my goodness, I'm, I'm looking at your career in, in my prep. And I've seen you in probably at least 30% of, uh, of the projects that you have been doing. I, I came to the United States in 1989, and I pretty much have seen you uh, all throughout uh, you know, my, my entire American life. So what a career you've had thus far. Congratulations, it's wonderful. Thank you. you. It sounds like you've seen more of my work than my children have. Well, we can change that. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> and and set a schedule for them. Give them some certain suggestions of yes. what they need. To do. Yeah. Yes, I think a spreadsheet would work. Yes. I think so. We we can definitely attach that to this interview and make sure that your children, along with others, have that opportunity. <laughs> I I think my manager made it clear that I need you to be on that with my children. Thank you. Absolutely, Darlene. Um, I got it. Yeah. Um. You know. It's funny, I you were saying about you came here in 1989 and you've seen a lot of things. I got, there was some review of something, I think it was a some blog, I don't know what it was, some reviewer talking about Mad Men and mentioned the one Mad Men episode I did, they talked about all the actors in it who were kind of interesting in some other way besides being in this episode. And when they talked about me, they said, and Eve Gordon, who's been in every TV show since 1981. And I, I, I thought that was funny, but also it's weird because 1981 is when I graduated from drama school and started mm -hmm. doing things. And I, I feel like they did a little, a little research there to, to make that little comment. Um, yeah, uh, sorry for interrupting, but the, it's it's true they did. Um, I, I did some of the same, and you kind of, you know, the next uh, point, the the question three on my list is. <laughs> uh, you kind of kicked it off in 1981 and 1982 with, you know, uh, or around that time, Ryan's hope on the TV side and the world according to Garp on, uh, on you know, the uh, the big screen. It's it's a great. I almost, I almost forgot about Ryan's hope. Um, yeah. I think if I had done soaps, I would have quit acting, and I would have quit acting knowing I couldn't act because I think that soaps, the way they were done in 1981 anyway, are yeah. so difficult and they just steamroller all the talent out of you and all you can do is hang on for dear life and try to remember your lines. And there was a young woman I was acting with, I don't think in the scene, but she was in, you know, in, in the green room with me, who had been on for a while and she was making, I remember she told me she was making $100,000 a year and I remember at the time, you now that's a lot of money but back in 1981 i was just blown away by the money and yeah. and she was just saying to me okay what do i do to become a serious actor and to get out of this and to do what you do and i was i was like you want to get out of this it's 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 a hundred thousand dollars are you crazy and then i tried doing the scene and there's cue cards and cameras moving and i'm like barely saying the lines in time and i thought okay that was a disaster they go cut and i thought oh god that was a bad rehearsal. And then they go, okay, moving on. And that was it. They they put on the air whatever crap came out of your mouth in the nick of time. If, it, if you didn't vomit on screen, they just kept it going. And, and yet when you watch a soap, they seem to be pretty good because there is a special talent you have to have to be able to get it together fast. And I didn't have that. I think I, I have it now. I think I'm much faster than I used to be. But when I, that was my very first, it was my very second thing I ever did on film. And uh, it shook me to the core. And I, I'm glad I never did that world anymore because it really would have thrown me completely. The very first thing I ever did on screen was the world according to Garp. I was yeah. so new to film. I, at the Yale School of Drama, where I was a student at the time when I filmed this, I uh, they had no film classes at all. They were, it was still a holdover from when, from when Robert Brustein was running the Yale School of Drama, where he was very much more sort of towards a poor theater, experimental theater, real theater, new forms of acting, 
discovering, un ripping open the idea of what theater was. And it, they just didn't want you to worry about going to Broadway or making money or any of that stuff. So the idea of learning how to do film acting was it, against their point of view at the time. Um, yeah. reading, I was reading Eric Bentley's obituary today. Um, he died at the age of 103. And he was, a, I think, a... a very influential voice at our school. Um, just the whole idea of eschewing money, popularity, Broadway, all that, and really trying to have integrity and all that. Anyway, so there I was cast in the world according to Garth because as a second year student, George Roy Hill, who was the director of that movie um, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and The Sting and lots of wonderful movies, he was directing our second year acting project and he told the casting director, um, just cast um, everybody you can from this class. Wow. And she didn't like that order at all. She was a really great, um, she was the greatest of the greats casting director. There was a whole movie about her. So the uh, the casting director of The World According to Garp was Marion Darty, who's just one of the greatest casting directors ever. And she did not like George Roy Hill telling her to cast as many of us as she could. And she was very, very skeptical. And and yet it so happened the part that I got was one that I, I'm perfect for. It was just somebody who's stammering and uncertain. And I could just do that. I could just, I could do naturalism really well. I could do this kind of non-acting acting well, yeah. which didn't serve me very well in drama school, but it it was just exactly what, she wanted for this movie. So she did end up casting me and about four other people from our class mm -hmm. instead of all 15 of us, which was unfortunate. But anyway, um, that was my very first time on film. They have me go to Long Island. I find my way to Long Island and they, I'm, I, I'm going to the hair and makeup trailer and they don't do anything to my hair or my face. And I figured they just said, you're fine. And they said, go away. And I thought, Okay, that's the way movies are. I was perfectly okay with that. I was like 23 years old or something, and yeah. I looked okay. I never wore makeup anyway in real life, as I usually don't anyway in real life, to my agent's dismay. <clears throat> anyway, so I uh, showed up on the set, wandering around kind of, and uh, the AD, the assistant director, said, okay, s stand here and we'll tell you what to do. And they had a little conference and they said, okay, run up to your mark, look to the left, look to the right, and then run all the way over to the house. And I said, okay, what's a mark? And everybody just started laughing, um, the whole crew. And I I thought, I've just said something wrong. And they said, the mark is that thing on the ground, that X, you know, they were, they were just so convulsed because I think it was a pretty big movie, a big budget movie. And there's this person saying, what's a mark? Wow. Um, I was the mark. Um, so, and then Robin Williams was, it was my very first scene ever in film and it's with Robin Williams. And it was a scene where I have to run up to his door trying to leave him a letter. And then he says, hey, and I whip around and I'm all shocked. And he says, what are you doing here? And I, I, I try to explain, but I can't because I'm so shocked that he caught me. And he starts scolding me because he thinks I've cut my tongue out, which is a cult thing to do among these people called Ellen Jamesians. Only I haven't cut my tongue out, I'm just tongue tied. So finally, when he stops for a breath after scolding me, I say, I didn't know you knew, meaning the thing I've written the letter about, and then I run away. Okay, so it's a very complicated scene and it's mm. hard to do because you have to stutter without using your tongue. You know, you can't go, I, the, 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 this, this, I, but, I, but I, you can't do that because he has to believe you don't have a tongue. So you have to do all kinds of stuttering without using your tongue. I'm, I'm trying to just get in the mood of it. But Robin, who had what I always told people was comedy Tourette's, he just couldn't stop joking. Um, and I mean, couldn't. And this is before he was, it was after Mork and Mindy, but it was before maybe yeah. things like Good Will Hunting, where he became really well known for his work. Um, he was a celebrity, but he he was a little unsure of himself. And I think to calm himself down, he just wanted to tell me jokes, constantly, constantly, constantly telling me jokes off screen. And I was trying really hard to stay in the mood of somebody who's scared to run into anybody 
and planning to run up to somebody's. So he's telling me this joke and he's he's telling it really well. It's a great joke. And it's and the camera and the crew. And I remember, I don't even know what a mark is. And people are saying things like speed, camera, folk. they're saying these things and they go and action. And I know what that means. And and I'm and I'm about to run from the camera onto the porch and Robin's standing right next to me and he's not done with the joke and I don't really know what to do. They go, action, and I go, I take a breath and he finishes the joke, which is hysterically funny. And I wanna laugh and I start running and trying not to laugh. It actually was really good for the scene because I was so thrown that when I ran up onto the porch and he yelled at me and I turned around and I was freaked out. It, it, you know, he'd made me more nervous than I even was anyway. I always attributed that to him being kind and doing it on purpose. I, I'm not 100% sure he did it on purpose. I'm not 100% sure he could help himself from constantly joking. And I think he was just fucking with me. But mm -hmm. it was it was fun and it was great. And then he was pretty generous because it could ease, if they if they had done it the way people usually film conversations, which is cut to him, cut to me, cut to him, cut to me. It would have been the Robin Williams show and you would have heard my voice behind him while he watched me talk. Because that's the way they film things all the time. Uh, my husband, who's also an actor, he and I often will watch TV or a movie and we'll be sitting there eating our popcorn and we'll watch the star's face while we hear the guests start talking at length. And we'll say to each other, that he thought he was going to be on camera. You know, it's like you just kind of, it's just one of the things that happens when you're a guest star. So I was kind of a guest star in the world according to Garp in, in a sense. I was just a supporting nothing player. And Robin said to the director, um, let's do this in a two shot. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but the, it ended up being a two shot, which was just us profile side by side, me, freaking out while he's haranguing me and then me coming up with my my um, final line and running away. And it, of course it worked best in a two shot. It's the right directorial yeah. decision. Um, but I think it was super generous of him because that didn't serve him for it to be in a two shot. Uh, so I think it was really generous. Yeah. That's all. <clears throat> one of uh, probably my my biggest regret and that's just a selfish silly thing to say but you know as I started the show the man who I admired for for many many years Robin Williams I'm never going to get a chance to interview him and that's that's my probably biggest regret um he's yeah uh, I um it's amazing complicated, that... complicated man um yeah. he he um I, I think we've we've learned, I don't know enough about it, but I think we've learned that since he had Louis body dementia, that it's different than Parkinson's. It's a form of Parkinson's, but it's it's really rough and they don't have a treatment for it. And so when people say that he killed himself, which he did, yeah. it's it's a little bit like, I think in the future, if they don't come up with a treatment for, for this, it, yeah. If they get a little more open-minded about um, assisted suicide, I think that he would be a, he would have been a candidate for look. I I would really like to not keep going with this torturous brain hallucination I'm getting all the time. I I don't think it's the same as he was depressed and he killed himself. It's it's not quite like that. It's complicated. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. Um, again, yeah. this is. This is neither here nor there, but uh, I remember when he died, I kind of had this, in a way, and you know, out of body uh, experience where, for a, a little period of time, I felt like um, everybody who doesn't believe in this stuff just you know, uh, stay stay tuned for a few minutes. But uh, <laughs> I, I really felt like you know, Robin kind of uh, uh, got got inside of me, and I was channeling him because my mind started racing, and he just started talking. And it, it was it was a really interesting experience. I have done channeling before. This is not a new thing, but I, I really felt like Robin uh, Robin was talking, and then he you know he left. So it was a was really it you, was it before you knew he died? 
No, no, I can't say that. It, I, it was but after. Still, but still, yeah. the fact that, okay, you knew he died and then you maybe, okay, I don't know if I believe in any of this either, but. I, yeah, I if thought we about are, If we are, if our consciousness, if we are all one and our consciousness is everywhere, yeah. it could be you summoned some part of him and we're yeah. connected to it for a minute. I, that sounds, sounds really touching. I can't believe you. your mind was racing and you were thinking about him and thinking like him. Yeah, and and it it kind of for wow. whatever that time was, I I felt a, a little bit of what it was like, and you know yourself well enough to know that's me, that's not me. And I was uh, specifically thinking of Robin because I was sad that he uh, that he passed away, and then just came in. Wow. And, and then uh, you know he was gone. I wish I would have written down what he said, which I didn't because I was so shocked by what happened. <laughs> but it's yeah. Uh, you know, most most of the favorite movies that uh, that I've watched, he was a part of, and um, uh, I'll I'll always have this kind of little special uh, connection. That yeah, it's yeah, it's it's my beautiful, beautiful. My movie. favorite my favorite thing he ever did was when Christopher Reeve was injured, yeah. and yeah. he came into his his hospital room and entertained him, and he said he he. You know, he was dreading it. He didn't want to. He was terrified, but he knew I have got to do this. He was his best friend and roommate for so long. He knew he had to do this. He had to face this. That's yeah. such deep kindness, such deep empathy. Uh, so he was really special. Yeah. So again, I, I, I could talk about Robin for uh, for a long time. I can go into the you know the other the other reasons why I think I was convinced that you know this was uh, a genuine type of moment because I've had things before that uh, that bore out uh, where I was giving information that I had no way of knowing and they turned out to be real. So that, that's that's a separate conversation for a different day. Um, maybe maybe you should be hypnotized and try to remember what he said to you. What what yeah. you said. What what you remembered. You know. I, I'd be I'd be I'd be for it absolutely. Yeah. Go for it. And then okay. let's okay. Yeah, right. let, let's uh, let's let's explore that. I'm I'm happy to do it. Uh, I've done past life regression before, and I've done uh, kind of uh, you know different forms of uh, of hypnotism, even though past life regression is not exactly like that. But, um, it all fast. It just completely is fascinating to me. I'm not a I'm not a believer, but I'm not a skeptic. I'm just kind of I wish I knew. Um, oh. about a about a year ago, for the very first time ever in my life, I did a <clears throat> what do you call it? Um, one of those drugs, a hallucinogenic drug, because I just mm -hmm. wanted to see what everybody was talking about. But yeah. I did it in this really safe environment with this, like, it was like the way Cary Grant did it, you know, like with a professional and, you know, it, uh, hours of intake before doing it and then hours of analysis afterwards. So I didn't really get. Everybody who really does this stuff tells me, oh, that's not how you, do it. you just take it and you go out into the woods and you go, whoa, we're all one. I didn't get that really. I just disappeared into some interesting visions and thoughts. But, you know, I, I do think there is something beyond the consciousness that we experience right now. For me, again, all right. So, we're, guys, we're going to get into this for a few minutes. So, uh, you know, come back and, and fast forward if you like. But uh, <laughs> uh, it was one of those things where I stopped questioning it when, you know, I would, uh, I, I, you know, studied with uh, with uh, a famous medium. And uh, she would literally put us in a room uh, across from people who were just, you know, it's 30 seconds in front of every person. And these are people that we've never seen before. And you have a person, go. You're supposed to uh, kind of connect and say uh, uh -huh. this is about you know giving them a message from uh, from beyond and the stuff that was coming out of my mouth and the, this stuff that was coming in there's no way any of that i would know i would be talking wow. about some mother who's visiting through the light and she knows that because you know in the kitchen anytime she sees that light she knows it's her mom and she smells that you know that particular smell the woman starts breaking down and crying there's another person who's sitting in a wheelchair and I'm I'm looking at him, and I'm I, I have two different uh, two different diseases that come to mind. I'm like, I don't know which one it is, and I'm telling him two, and he's like, Yeah, I have both. I'm like, What? The and you have no time to kind of analyze. You just have to go, go, go. You kind of disconnect. Yeah. You can do it. So once I started having these things, 
it's like, okay, uh, there's something obviously that's going on and we can imagine it's not happening, but it happened enough times where yeah. randomly I would be sitting next to a woman who I've never met at a, at a convention and her father comes uh, uh, to me and you know tells me his name. And of course I'm chicken and uh, I kind of ask her, I know I, you know, I feel like your dad has passed away. What is his name? Knowing that she's about to say his name, she says it. I was like, okay, you know, how, how do you know? Uh, right? Wow. Yeah, you I just, used to love that TV show Medium. And which uh, you were on. yeah. Oh, which I was on. <laughs> I'm, I know uh, my kids think it's slightly obnoxious that whenever they mention something, I go, yeah, I know him. Or, yeah, I was on that show. Or I did an episode of that. It yeah. is obnoxious, but thank you for doing it instead of me doing it. Um, yeah. And I, I read, the, you know, some articles about how it was, you know, based on a real person who yeah. found some inexplicable answers for the police department at, somewhere in Arizona, Phoenix, or something. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, there's something. There's some people who are sensitive. There's some people who pick up things the rest of us don't. And then this is sort of different, but if you've ever read the book, and I do recommend it, The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker, he's I a, uh, I recommend it. He's, he's, I guess he's well known for being a personal security expert. He is a business helping celebrities who are being stalked. I think right now he's working for Jeff Bezos, actually. Um, but he wrote a book, he, his, he just, firmly believes that people should be aware of their instincts and act on them. And the gift of fear is that you have a gift, which is just having a funny feeling and to listen to that feeling. It's a great book. I won't, I won't um, talk about it anymore, but just, uh, I think if Gavin Becker were here, he would tell you, you know, listen to your, what your voices are telling you because, uh, they work out they mean something they lead to good things yeah um i i last story i promise uh the uh, the experience that freaked me out and that uh, made me think that i never want to uh want to do this kind of work uh is i studied with a uh with a you know intuitive who um works with police departments and fbi and he helps them you know kind of uh, solve uh, cases and find children he has an accommodation from the pope uh, and a thank you letter for you know helping with all those so what he did is he basically set us all around in a circle and he took white pieces of paper uh, on some of them he wrote something on some of them he didn't he folded them many many times so you cannot see anything he put them in a pot and kind of uh, you know uh, stirred it and uh, he passed it around and we were supposed to reach in grab a piece of paper uh just touch it uh, obviously not look at it not you know unfold it uh, and then write whatever comes and you know i've i've had experiences before i'm thinking okay let's go i can do this this is not a big deal you know i grab the piece of paper i start concentrating and nothing is coming nothing nothing at all and at that point i'm getting discouraged i'm thinking well this sucks you know i'm gonna look stupid and as soon as I let go, I immediately start feeling something that's weird. And I start feeling uh, blood kind of trickling. Uh, this is not me, but it's me. I, I start feeling blood trickling down my, my face. I'm like, oh, this is weird. Okay, but continuing with this. And then kind of it opens up and I see a you know marsh uh, area and it's dark. And... I am in this body that's laying in this uh, in this kind of area, and uh, then two men. I see kind of uh, them walking towards one with a shovel. I feel uh, kind of a hit on the head uh, with the shovel. The person uh, is done. Then I see that body uh, being dragged, and then I get a uh, kind of I get that sense that the body was uh, unfortunately uh, kind of. Uh, put into many, uh, many pieces and kind of spread all over that area. So I come out of that little uh, trance. I write it all down. I'm thinking, this is the freakiest thing I've ever seen. I never want to do this again, but I write it down. And then he collects all of these pieces of paper, you know, after everybody writes it down, he takes them out. He starts kind of, uh, re he asks people, what, uh, what have you uh, seen? And I raise my hand, I describe it and he keeps on kind of uh, nodding. I'm like, what are you nodding? 
he said, okay, so on some pieces of paper, there was nothing. On some pieces of paper, I wrote down the name of, you know, cartoon characters. And on some pieces of paper, like yours, I wrote down actual uh, murder and uh, other C, uh, uh, cases that I was working on. And the case that you were describing is an actual case that happened outside of Illinois, whatever number of years ago. And they know they found this unfortunate person. They found him in this marsh area. Uh, they found his body in, in all sorts of pieces. But they knew that he died from a blunt uh, hit to the head. They didn't know what it was with. I'm like, a shovel. It was a shovel. <laughs> it was a shovel. And it was uh, kind of uh, two men that did it. Um, it blew my mind. It shocked me. And it made me think that, no, thank you. I do not want to do this again because this is not the type of energy that I ever want to be playing with. And uh, I, I kind of sat with that. But like things like that, um, and it's not something I'm developing or really working on uh, doing, but some of us are more sensitive. I think I have some of that. Um, yeah. And, you know, it is it is what it is. So when, when Robin's uh, thing happened to me, it was like, okay, I, Robin is talking to me. Whether I am crazy or not, uh, yeah. you believe what you decide, but that's that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, my advice is go to someone who can help you go into some kind of trance and recreate what he said, yeah. write it down or something, because you're you're curious. You have a you have a regret. You mentioned you have a regret that you never mm -hmm. talked to him, and I think that's telling you that you need to look into this and see if you can find out what it was. And I don't think it'll be anything earth shattering, but for some reason you're thinking about, it. and the very fact that you want to interview me, which is, you know, I'm nobody, I'm nobody, I'm nobody famous. I'm not very important, et cetera. But, but my very first movie was with Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, that's the first thing I started talking about, even though I don't think about it very often. Um, so there's something there that, that is worth you taking in deeper look into i agree i, I believe in signs yeah. uh, i i look at this one as one of them so I, i'll definitely take a look at it thank you yeah sure well uh let's let's get back to the regularly scheduled programming at this rate we will never get to <laughs> like irresistible <laughs> um and funny you know funny you mentioned irresistible it actually was not one of my questions you have so many projects that i could have asked about I had to kind of cherry pick and I, I, pick, I picked ones that I don't think you are normally asked about, except for obviously Felicity, <laughs> um, because I know that we can talk for another three hours with me talking about Monk and me talking about ER and me talking about, you know, a party of five and all of these shows that I really want to ask you questions about, but we'll never get the, <laughs> to the end of it. So I have such cool stories about each of those things you said. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's do it this way. We're, I'm going to ask my questions and see the cool stories that you have for those. And if you have cooler ones for the other ones, jump in. I, I'm, I'm all sure. in. Yeah. Of course. So um, before we kind of continue on this route, um, I, I just wanted to know, I know uh, kind of, uh, as you've mentioned, you, uh, you graduated from Yale with your MFA, but when did you know that acting was your thing and you're going to pursue it? Um, about halfway through Yale, uh, when I, I went to Brown undergraduate and I was a history major and I was going to go to a combined history degree and law degree at Harvard. My, both my parents went to Harvard and I just didn't feel like being a lawyer, but I thought I should. My mother was a historian and my father was a lawyer and I, I, would, I guess I didn't have much of an imagination or it's kind of immature. I don't know what, but I just didn't really think about it, but just figured I'd probably do something with maybe be a historian or something because <clears throat> i really really love to this day history the study of history and i wrote a hundred page honors thesis at brown on english radicals involvement in the spanish civil war and i just loved history and i, I took nothing but english and history classes the whole time i was at brown because you can do that you can you can um if you want to you can take you have to take like 32 classes and they can be anything you want. And I tried biology, I tried a few other courses, I just couldn't make it past a couple of weeks and I would, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting too far off. But anyway, I, um, 
I liked acting in plays, but I I thought you'd you'd have to be an idiot to do that for for a job because there are just no parts. It's a terrible business to be in. Um, very hard to get cast. Very hard to make a living. And that hasn't changed. And I just thought I was not a foolish sucker type person, and that I would do something intelligent, like that I was already proven to be good. Plus, I was really bad at acting. I had I loved doing plays in high school. I was pretty good in high school compared to high school people. But then in college, I could tell I just wasn't really very good. Um, I would try, but I was very stiff. Didn't really know how to do it. And then I did one play and I was actually good. Like something happened, something clicked and I got into it. And I sort of felt like, wow, that was a great feeling. But still, that's like saying, um, I really liked, I went skydiving once. Oh, I'm now going to be a skydiver for the rest of my life. I was just, I liked the feeling of acting, but again, it, it didn't seem sensible. And then um, my parent, my father told me he wasn't going to pay for um, anything after college. And if I went to graduate school, he wouldn't pay for it either. But I secretly knew that my grandparents who really loved me, um, I had a feeling if I got into some, graduate school somewhere they'd pay for it i just really didn't want to hit the real world yet and i didn't want to go to law school i just didn't want to i what it is is i noticed i hadn't applied it was like autumn of my senior year and i noticed i hadn't yet applied to law school or taken the lsats or anything and i go i need another year i need a year to figure out what i want to do with my life and i um thought well if i go to drama school that's like playtime it's like pretending to be a tree or a dog. It's playing games. It's just so much fun. That's like what the most fun thing in the world is, is acting. So I'll do that for a year and I'll have my grandparents pay for it by it being graduate school somewhere. This is not making me look good at this story. I know that, but it's just the truth. And I um, was applying to some drama schools. I don't know which ones. And then my father called me up and said, Oh, I hear you're applying to drama school. You should know that if you go to Yale, any child of a member of the Allegheny Bar Association who goes to Yale gets their tuition paid by this Kennedy T. Friend scholarship. So if anybody's listening to this and they have a father or a mother in the Allegheny Bar Association, apply to Yale. So I thought, okay, I'll apply to Yale drama school, but that's kind of a joke. That's like Yale Drama School. No, not for someone who isn't an actor, who's actually a pretty bad actor, doesn't really know what she's doing. I just had my moments. I, I had inspiration. I had a I had I had an idea how to do this. I had some thoughts on it, but I wasn't really sure. And it seemed to be clickish, like if if you wanted to be in acting and thought well of you had to do it the way everybody else did it, but I kind of wanted to do it a different way. Uh anyway, so I have I auditioned and maybe because I wasn't worried about it, I got in, which was a real, a real shock to everyone, except for my favorite drama school teacher who was completely certain I would get in. He always believed in me and he's still my good friend. And his name is John Amy and he's a professor emeritus at Brown University. <clears throat> so John believed in me and he said, oh, of course you got into Yale, so off you go. And I got there feeling like I was, you know, had gotten away with something and I was a total fraud. And on our first day in drama school, the, our teacher, there's only 15 of us in the class. And our teacher said to us, uh, you're wondering how you got in. And we all froze because of course, everyone's secretly wondering how the hell they got in. She goes, you were the 15 least nervous people who auditioned. Huh. <laughs> and that is a that's a story I tell I now teach too and I tell my students um it's the most humbling thing to hear that there were probably people a lot better than we were in fact I know there were um I've met some people who auditioned for my class who I know are just stunning actors and they were probably just scared and when you're scared you freeze up a little and your soul doesn't come out and you just in acting, what you have to do is just keep trying to let everything get out of the way and purely do the be the person in the room in the moment. Just try to live in the present. And 
I could do that back then because I, I was only applying because it would be free if I got in. So I couldn't, I couldn't not. And it was a short train ride from Brown to Yale. And I was like, okay. And I remember they asked me questions in my audition and I answered them completely honestly in a very uh, self-deprecating way. Not, I wasn't trying to be humble. I was just telling the truth. Um, and I don't know, they just, they liked me, they let me in. But so I spent the whole first year and I remember a whole bunch of us sat around the table, the actors introducing ourselves to each other at a local pizza joint and telling a little bit about ourselves. And everybody had a story like, well, I used to put on plays when I was four years old and I've always wanted to be an actor. And I started the drama club at my school and I've written seven plays and people were just such serious actors. And I had nothing to say except that I'm going to be here for a year until I go to law school, which I knew wouldn't go over well. So I didn't tell them that. And I said, oh, I'm just, I like being put in place. <laughs> and then, um, then I, then first year moves on to second year. And all of a sudden I'm in my second year. I still haven't thought about it. I, I'm the most passive person I've ever met, at least at this port, point in my life. And then John Madden, who, and who you might know his name. He directed the uh, movie Shakespeare in Love and, and yeah. uh, so many other movies. Um, he was our second year acting teacher. And he took me to the local um, breakfast joint, Gags, which I don't think is there anymore. And he said, okay, I'm taking you to lunch because I need to sit you down and ask you what's going on. And I go, what do you mean? And he said, you, you feel to me like you're half here and half not here. Like you have one foot out the door. Like you don't really want to be here. Um, what is your, what is your deal? And I said, well, since you ask, um, oh, what a relief. I can tell you the truth, John. Um, I'm not an actor. I'm not going to be an actor. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to be a lawyer. Huh. I'm so glad I can finally tell somebody, but you know, so I'm just here. I mean, it'll, it'll make me a better lawyer to be able to speak in public and talk to the jury and all that. And he's just looking at me like, he goes, stop, 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 because you're an actor. So just forget about all that. No, well, he said it with a really cool English accent. Yeah, you're an actor. Forget about all that other stuff. So so I was shocked by him saying, but I thought he would, like when you confess something to somebody, you sort of think they're going to be oh, welcoming and kind and ooh, ah, you know, you're telling them a secret. I was telling him my biggest secret and he was just ridiculing me kind of just shaking his head and denying it utterly denying it and saying no you're an actor moving on what are you going to do about it and I so I actually sat down and wrote a, on, a, on a piece of paper a list of the people who believed in me and the people who clearly did not believe in me because there were a lot of people at Yale who just who really could not believe I was there there were, there were a lot of people who hated a lot of people it was, it was a very toxic school at the time a uh, whole bunch of us later, I found out even the most sort of often cast and well thought of people c called it the jail school of trauma or something. It was just a very um, anxiety making place to be. And mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I wrote a list of who believed in me and who didn't. And I saw that the people who believed in me were the the really great artists, you know, John Madden and, and John Guare and Arthur Copet and just all these people who had come up to me and said, you know, you're good, you're special. And then the people who didn't like me were like the head of the stage management department and the, and the most awful people who I didn't want them to like me anyway. And I, I don't mean there's anything wrong with stage management. I just mean this particular stage manager hated me. And he hated me for a good reason. I mean, I was probably late to a lot of rehearsals. I was very flaky. Like we had a fencing class at 9 a.m. I calculated that I would never have to fence in my life in any production. So I never went to fencing class. I went for a few weeks and I learned the basics. And then I said, I don't know why I'm in this class anymore. And I'm not going anymore. And she would run into me in the street. Wonderful teacher. Oh, I can't remember her name now. I wonder why I can't remember her name. And she was really sweet. And she said, why do you not come to class? And I said, I, if I get cast as Viola in Twelfth Night, I will need to fence, but I will need to fence badly because Viola in Twelfth Night fences badly. So, so I 
uh, so that's what I mean. I was kind of a flaky, yeah. uh, frustrating person if you were um, inclined to want people who showed up on time and did the right thing. I ever since it's funny, I'm not like that anymore. I'm always early, I'm always on time, I always do what I'm supposed to do. But that's because the business drills it into you that you really have so many people um, counting on you, you can't like out. Yeah. So you ask me, when did I know I wanted to be an actor? Um, yeah. The answer is after having lunch with John Madden, halfway through my second year in drama school, I finally faced it, that I was gonna try to do this. On the other hand, I, I used to tell people this, and then I found my diary from when I was 10 years old and I saw I had written on a page in my little 10 year old writing, I want to be an actress. So I think somewhere deep down I wanted to do it, but I, I'm also from a very um, judgmental waspy family where everybody was a doctor or a lawyer or a um, professor. And the idea of being anything in the arts was not in my history anywhere, in my family tree anywhere. Although I think because I was female and am female, I think because I'm uh, a female, I was not, uh, nobody stood in my way. I think if I had been born a boy, they would not have let me. Um, they would have taken me really seriously and they didn't take me seriously. I, I remember when I told my father that I decided to go to Brown instead of Harvard because everybody in the family went to Harvard and I was like, no, I felt like I, it was too scary. Harvard was too scary. And I went, was going to Brown instead. I my father to let him know. And he said, well, you don't want to be a career girl anyway. Now, I don't even know what that, I didn't even know what that phrase meant back then. And, but it's clearly a sexist kind of BS phrase, meaning you don't want to be a professional person. You just want to be, then I, I, and I took it as, I took it as insulting, even though he was trying to be consoling or something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, having this waspy, um, uptight kind of background um, meant I was kind of flying blind when it came to being an actor. I didn't have anybody in my family who'd done anything of the kind and didn't really know how to go about it. And, and yet it was handed to me on a platter by the sheer luck of getting into Yale, where I would say, if you go to a school like Yale or Juilliard or, or any of the great places, you get about two years of benefit of the doubt. I think then you, when you go to an audition, people will go, oh, he went to Yale. Let's take a look at this. And benefit of the doubt is what you need as an actor. And you can't really manufacture it. You just have to hope you can finagle it somehow. I, I This is not your question, but I'm going to say a little something theoretically about you know, acting and how you get jobs and stuff. And something I noticed when I was... Um, my husband had been cast in the lead in a TV series when we were engaged. And um, so I flew out with him to LA from New York to hang out with him and to meet my agents. And I mean, I had New York agents, but they had a West Coast office and I wanted to meet them and I wanted to start auditioning for things. And it was pilot season and he's doing his, his pilot and seven episodes of whatever it was. And I was doing nothing. And so I was auditioning a little bit and um, I would walk into these rooms and get no, just no, they just didn't see me. I felt like I was in the wrong room all the time. I'd walk in and they'd go, hello. Yeah, what are you gonna do for us today? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, bye. I mean, literally like not looking in my direction I've heard other stories of people who, people took phone calls during the audition and they said, no, keep going, keep going. And they, they keep talking. It's almost like the audition is something they had to get through, but they weren't watching. And that sense of them not watching me, not seeing me was so frustrating. And then, and then I got um, a big deal pilot. I got um, something that was the talk of the town. It was the number one pilot of the season. I'm not gonna talk about it because uh, I'll explain someday. But I got that pilot. I got the job. And now everybody was interested, including 
to all of Todd's producers when I would come to visit him instead of me being the girlfriend or the fiance or whatever, they would kind of want to talk to me and say, oh, so you're doing that pilot, are you? So, like, whoa, they wanted, they wanted to talk to me and they were really impressed and I just had this glow about me and it was very, very flattering and heady, but it was also blatantly different from the day before. Yep. And um, then I started going on other auditions because just because you have a pilot doesn't mean you stop auditioning because the pilot might not go and you, there's movies and there's things happening. So I continued going on auditions only this time. I'd walk in the room and they would stand up because I was there and they would come over and they would shake my hand and they would lead me to the chair. They would offer me water or coffee. And it was, um, it was so different from the way I had been treated three weeks earlier when I arrived in, in LA. I would arrived in LA, I'd auditioned to, to nobody looking at me. And then I'd gotten this thing and now all of a sudden everybody was really looking at me and paying attention and laughing at my jokes and loving all my work and offering me more things. And I realized, I don't know how you control that or how you make that happen. But what I did tell myself and I told all my friends, all my fellow actor friends, I said, um, when I'm on the way down again, I'm going to remember how meaningless it is to be taken seriously as an actor. It's yeah. just lucky. And, and so I was on my way up and I felt like shit. I felt like a useless, talentless person. And then when they suddenly thought I was really great and really talented, I felt so wonderful. But then I remembered, oh, this happened so suddenly that I have the opportunity of a lifetime to say, don't forget. Uh, you're the exact same actor you were three weeks ago. Yeah. You didn't get any better. You didn't suddenly learn how to act. They just started paying attention to you, giving you the benefit of the doubt, liking you for who you are instead of ignoring you for who you are. And so I thought, said, when I'm on my way down again, because uh, with rare exceptions, actors have ups and downs. I thought, don't take that seriously either. Don't take it personally when people stop being interested when you walk in the room. And then I have a really good friend named Eve Allard who wrote the movie Down With Love and she also wrote Legally Blonde too, and she's very witty. And I told her this story early on, like right after it happened, right? Many, many decades ago. And she said, um, my favorite part of this story is three weeks ago when I was nobody. <laughs> like she liked the idea that I was trying to be, you know, sober and humbling, but it was kind of fucking weird that it happened in three weeks, yeah. which is weird. It, that's weird and lucky. Um, but all it did for me was capsulize, make it so clear how meaningless success is, how it d isn't connected to actual ability. It's just luck. This, the reason I got this pilot was I was, so, I was doing audition after audition after audition and getting nowhere. And back then, I was kind of cute. It was like 19, when was, 85 or four. And I was, I was kind of cute. It was like girl next door, kind of pretty kind of thing. And I would say to my husband, my now husband, I would say, um, is this too sexy? I would walk into the room with some outfit and I go, is this too sexy? And he's like reading and he doesn't even look up and goes, no, it's not too sexy. Like he knows you have to go sexy all the time. Well, I was getting really, the feminist in me, which is the whole me, was getting really sick that and one day I had an audition for this thing I ended up getting that ended up changing everything. And I just said, fuck you, LA, and your sexist bullshit. And I dressed kind of like a man. I wore a man's shirt and a man's tie and a floor length brown skirt and hiking boots. And at the time I had brown hair, kind of curly, um, part in the middle and people had always told me I was a dead ringer for Diane Keaton. People always used to say that uh, Before I knew who she was people would say have you seen Annie Hall and I would say oh, no I haven't and they would say oh my god You look exactly like Annie Hall. And so I was kind of resentful of it um, And what I hadn't because I didn't wasn't really very aware of Diane Keaton who now of course I think is God's gift. I think she's phenomenal, but I wasn't very aware of her at the time but I, what I didn't realize was she also dresses that way. She always wears like a tie and a suit and a big hat and gloves and weird things and boots. And 
I just unconsciously just put on men's clothes out of a kind of just feeling like I don't want to play your game anymore, Hollywood. So I go to this audition and they make me wait for a while in the waiting room before they call me in. And then they call me in and I walk in and I read and they're just staring at me like they've been hit with a mallet and they're just staring at me and they aren't even responding to anything. I'm acting, I'm being kind of whimsical and, and don't have to cry, I have to laugh, I have to do all these things and they're just staring at me. And I left thinking that was a weird audition. I Before I get home, I have an offer for the pilot. And it's like the biggest pilot happening that season. And I thought, what? how did that happen? So I'm not gonna ask any, any questions. I'm just gonna take the part. So partway through filming it, they were so nice to me. They liked me so much. And I said, finally said to the executive producer, I said, can you tell me why you cast me? You know, like out of all the fish in the sea? He said, okay, I'll tell you. He said, um, we wrote your part, we wrote your part. We had, we saw like 800 women for it. And we didn't see anybody who really rang our bell exactly. And, and right before you came in, we said to the cast director, stop, stop the auditions for a second. We need to have a little conference. And so the cast director came outside and told us all to, to wait because they needed to talk. And they looked at each other, the, all the producers, and they said, what do we want? from this character, what do we want in this character? Who is she, what do we want? Because we've seen people and we, we don't like them, but I think we have to really think about what we want. And they said, okay, what we want is Annie Hall. That's what we want, we want Annie Hall. And okay, right, let's continue the auditions. And then I walked in the room with my brown hair, part in the middle and my men's clothes on. And didn't, I could have just gone, uh, hello, how are you? And they would have, loved me they would have tried to make it work with me but I was perfectly good for the part and that was just an interesting story I think in terms of the luck the yeah. sheer luck if I hadn't done that if I hadn't just decided that day to dress like Annie Hall and they hadn't stopped right before I walked in and said we want Annie Hall I would still be you know uh toiling away for a much longer time getting more and more resentful. I didn't have a chance to get resentful at all. So that's another thing I tell people is besides um, don't be nervous, don't be bitter. I tell people um, bitterness can kind of scald your soul. It can really harden you and form a protective callus that's necessary, possibly. But if you can stay, keep your heart open to experiences and open to life and open to hurt and work through it and and don't let it curdle your soul, then you will last in this business much longer. I mean, here I am at my ripe old age, I'm still working and I still like working and I'm a pretty happy person. And I think that if I had um, not been so lucky so early, I wouldn't have been able to not be bitter. And yet, if you are already bitter, let's say you're heading toward middle age or you're, you've been at it for three years or something and you're feeling bitter, you can just take a break and work on your happiness and what makes you happy and then come back to it knowing you expect nothing and you're just doing it for fun. I don't know if you know the actor Reed Burney. He's a wonderful actor. He won at least one Tony Award for um, the humans on, on Broadway. Great. I'm, I'm sure I know, but the name doesn't ring a bell. Um, well, he's a, a great actor. And he, um, he and I were in a couple of shows early on when we were young actors in New York together. And he, he and I were backstage at one of the shows. We were in two plays by, um, oh my God, what's wrong with my brain? The guy who wrote Gemini. Um, okay. I'm not gonna be able to remember uh, it. It's this not is... all in your brain, it's mine too. I can't, I can't remember that either, but go ahead. Anyway, um, we, we were in this play and we were backstage at Playwrights Horizons and Reed was just, dis, just feeling a lot of despair about the industry, you know, the business. It's called the business in New York, it's called the industry in LA. Uh, yeah. So he's feeling a little bit of despair about the business and he said, what do we even like about this business? What do we like? And I said, um, 
Well, we like, hold on, my phone's ringing. Let me turn it off. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's my daughter. <laughs> Bye, daughter. Oh, I'm not talking to you. Okay. So, um, so we were trying to think what do we like about, so Reed and I sat down and we were trying to figure out what do we like about this business anyway? And it was Reed who really wanted to figure it out. And I was pretty happy in the business, but I, I love Reed. So I was willing to go on this journey of despair with him. And we agreed that we hated auditioning. Auditioning is nerve wracking. You never do your best work in an audition. And it's just such a horrible competitive thing. Rehearsing can sometimes be incredibly tedious and frustrating. Opening night is nerve wracking. Long runs are tedious and make you just want to quit. We just went on and on and on about everything we didn't like about the business. We didn't like the costume fitting. We didn't like, we were, he was being negative and I was having fun being negative with him. And then we agreed, we figured out the thing we liked about the business. The one thing you could never take away that we loved, we agreed, was the phone call that you got the job. <laughs> and we were, I was really thought that was hilarious. Yeah. It's actually in real life. That's not what I love about the business, but it was our, it was our, it was our young, jaded conversation we were having. And he said, "I, I don't think I can do this anymore." And then next thing I knew, he took a year off. Uh, nobody takes a year off. Nobody quits the business. Nobody quits. You're in, you're in for life. Mm -hmm. And he quit. He quit, and he went around the world, and he traveled, and he had the most amazing experiences and he filled up his soul and i i was talking to him recently and he said it was the best thing he'd ever done um just stop the record stop the film turn off the lights just go away recharge refill then you know what why you're doing it when you come back to do it yeah it's Absolutely. It's so important. I hear that from actors all the time. Uh, that's one of the reasons why some actors uh, choose not to live in LA, because they need to be outside the bubble. They need to be in a real uh, place as opposed to a place that's all about the business or the industry in that case. So, um, yeah. Um, I got some advice early on to get a garden, get a dog, get a life. Mm -hmm. And I think um, having children was the thing that saved me. Uh, it, it definitely um, changed my career. I mean, I gave up a lot of parts because mm -hmm. I just wanted to be with my kids. I was offered the lead in a TV series that ran for like 10 years and I turned it down because my kid was one. And the main reason I turned it down, it was a really uh, misogynistic, anti-humanist, uh, homophobic show um, back when those things were allowed openly. and. Yeah even though it was tons of money, it was tens of thousands of dollars per episode. I remember my, my child was one and I was changing her diaper and she's, she's a female child. And I just looked at her and I thought, I can't, I can't do this to your world. I can't, I can't contribute to the misogyny of this world. I can't sign on to something where I would be supporting the misogyny. I can't do it. Um, yeah. I have a kid now. And um, then as I had another kid and as they got older, I just always, I just always wanted to be with them and being around them. And, I, and that's, that's the difference between chasing success and ch chasing happiness. Success does lead to happiness a lot of times, of course, but sometimes you have to choose um, something that will lead to success you have to decide if chasing something that will give you a bunch of success, but might harm you in some way, maybe you shouldn't do it. That one was a pretty easy call because it was a pretty hateful show. Yeah. But there's, there've been other times when I just thought, I think I just won't work for a couple of years. Let's see what happens then. And my agents were really patient, patient with me, which I appreciated. <laughs> yeah. It's well, first of all, you just came up with the name of this, uh, of the show, the, or the name of, uh, of your show. It's going to be chasing <laughs> happy. Uh, so there's, there's the title for that one. Um, Lovely. and it's, I, I see it's interesting parallels. I don't know if you know, Lewis, uh, Robbins. Um, she's a wonderful, uh, you know, New York uh, actress. Uh, yeah. she's not in LA 
she she was on the show recently, and uh, she you know uh, one of one of her uh, you know shows she's done soaps, and uh, you know uh, Ryan's uh, Ryan's Hope you know was the place that she's done a lot of work on, and then you know at the height kind of her successes, she just decided no, I'm a mother, I'm not going to work, and uh, she tried, and then it took a while to come back after it, but she took you know a, a step, and she said no, I, I I need to be doing this for my uh, for myself and for my kids. So, um, oh, yay, good for her. Yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting. And I'm so happy you uh, you mentioned bitterness because uh, today, um, you know, I, I started to get a little bitter. That's not a normal thing for me. I'm this happy-go-lucky person. I started getting a little bitter because um, in running the show, and I've been running it since, you know, May 20th. So it's not like I've been, uh, I've been around this uh, for a long time. <laughs> But, no. <laughs> um, Dealey, and I've met some incredible people along the way who uh, who are wonderful and genuine. And I started to meet the ones who are not like that. And uh, just uh, I, I had some conversations today that I'm sorry. I mean, it's it, it is it's life. I'm just, uh, and, sorry, I'm sorry that there's nothing more painful than a toxic person in this industry. I suppose there is something more painful. Yeah, this yeah. is in the industry I know, but oh, it's ugly when it gets ugly. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I kind of went to that place. So thank you for uh, for helping me get out of it. It took me uh, a better part of the day to to kind of get this stuff out of my system, and uh, I think I finally let it go as as you were talking. Thank you for that. Sometimes you have to think it through. Sometimes you really have to use logic, and yeah. sometimes you have to write down a list. You know, what about this person? What what is this person saying that that really is truthful and what is this person saying that is toxic and untruthful and is there anything good I can take out of this and but that's the funny thing this this business does attract the um narcissistic personality disorder people and yeah. there's nothing like that personality disorder to get you and make you think it's you and make you feel they they find what you feel bad about yourself about and yeah. and press on that it's a it's a gift <laughs> a terrible yeah. gift the yeah. wicked stepmother gift and um it can really hurt i'm sorry that you you had that we've all we've all had that i'm sorry we've all had that yeah the yeah. things people have said and done to us in this business um you all you have to do is read the me too stories and know that that's just one little part of it right and it's nothing even close to uh to kind of uh, what has been experienced by others so yeah oh don't I, denigrate don't downplay your own painful experience if somebody hurt you um or made you feel bad about yourself or doubt yourself or crossed you or, and got to you where you live they they did it and it hurts there's i often tell people you know, love is love and pain is pain. And you can't really say my pain doesn't really count. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it's uh, it, to me, everything is, is relative. So I, I agree with what you said. It's just I don't want to, you know, maximize it to that extent, I think. Sure. Um, sure. So. But yeah, bitterness. It's a. Yeah. It's important to work on not being bitter. You don't want to be a bitter old man. I don't want to be a bitter old woman. I and. Know. You work on it all the time, but just remembering what's real. Yeah, and uh, I, I have my family, and I have my family to uh, to give me that reality uh, every every day. I have my dog that's barking and uh, getting me out of it. <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's nice being in Chicago. We are a secondary market in terms of uh, you know TV and film, but it's nice kind of being in that space where I can be in this world. And then I can be out of it and I can find that balance. So, I love Chicago. Yeah. And you've been here. You've done uh, some work in Chicago. Again, we can, well, yeah. I, I'm looking at the time and I know that uh, I, I, uh, I can ask you a lot more questions, but why don't we kind of, you know, sure. those because the energy of it, you know, does not lend itself to me, to me asking, you know, silly things about uh, Felicity, even though Carrie Russell, I love you. I've, you know, my wife knows. Me this. too. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask you about your acting approach because you've, you've done uh, so many things and you teach 
what have you found that works? And you talked about naturalism, which I love. What have you found that is in your toolkit that you would advise uh, others on this works? Um, uh, okay, the main thing I would say is that we contain multitudes. Each yeah. of us, uh, when you talk about having had that um, that that paranormal experience of having been killed with a shovel to your head and yeah. feeling yourself die in a swamp, and I've heard other stories like that on you know This American Life or whatever. I've heard stories like that on the radio, mm. and, and there's something there. Um, so you could be a murder victim, you could be a murderer, you could be, you know, any, we can all be anything. I can, even though I, I, Eve, could never kill anyone. Yes, I could, you know, I guess. Um, because there are people who do kill people. So therefore, and I bet they, anyway, I'm getting off track. My point is we contain multitudes. Yeah. And what I always want my students to do and what I I figure is the way to do acting the way I do it is to become to to find the find in my soul and heart and experience and thoughts um the character to become the character and and so that it's not um external it's internal but external is part of it too um if a if the right hat or the right shoes or um makeup or something makes me feel more like the character and it always does the costume the costume fitting is the place where i often find the character um mm -hmm. when it's a great costume designer and so many of them are truly great it's writing it's it, they've written the character a little bit more for me and so if you combine the external and the internal, finding it in your soul, who who you are that is true for this character, and then whatever will help you on the outside. And this continually trying to do that mind meld with the character. Um, if you've ever seen The Fly, the Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis um, version yeah. of The Fly, which is just a beautiful movie. Um, yeah. There's there's a time when he's half Brindle, which is his character's name. Brundle? Brindle? I'm getting it wrong, but I always get everything wrong. Um, let's say his name is Brindle. We'll go and there. and then there's the fly, and then he's both. He's he's mixed, and he calls himself Brindlefly or Brundlefly, whatever the name is. And I tell my students this story, but I I. I tell it without going on and on about whether it's Brindle or Brindle, but I say to them, I want you to be Brindlefly when you're doing the character. I want you to be, if you're playing you know, Masha in The Three Sisters uh, and your name is Jane, I want you to be Masha Jane. It's, you'll never, you'll never not be Jane. There's no, no harm in it being Jane's Masha. You don't need to erase yourself or negate yourself. On the other hand, you don't want to be some modern 2020 masha you want to be if jane had been born in 18 whatever and had become been raised in moscow and and so on try to get as much of that into your soul as you can use any inspiration you can to get yourself there um i've been successful sometimes and unsuccessful sometimes but I always try. That's another thing is don't stop working. Don't stop trying. Don't stop. And the thing you're trying is to become this person, to get inside their soul. And, and then you have to forget. Uh, if you're trying to become a character, it's going to be a distraction to think about the camera and the lights and the, the, the microphone and so on. So you have to learn to sort of get used to those things and not let them distract you from your real purpose, which is really becoming that other person. Then in terms of maybe usable advice, you you want to communicate to the person you're communicating to on film or on stage. You want to 
uh, they uh, actors often talk about an action or an objective saying i want to seduce you like mike mike nichols always said that um that elaine may um used to say to him when in doubt seduce that mm -hmm. the best the best intention is to seduce because it is a very juicy thing yep. um and you can't always choose to seduce in every scene but you can choose to make the other person feel something i think that's a slightly more active objective than i want to kill you or i want to make you leave the room or i want to make you like me or whatever your objective might be make sure it's connected to making the other person feel something and then mm -hmm. it just becomes a little juicier more active i'd say in the most incredibly practical terms learn your lines as thoroughly as you can i used to learn my lines as late as i could on in theater because i thought i don't know i had some idea that it was more organic to not know them so soon and then harry groner is a really great actor who you should probably interview um harry groner who's in an acting company i'm in called antias in los angeles he is an old friend and i just love him and he is often at parties or whatever, we'll, I'll just say to him, oh, I love what you did. How did you do that? And some, like he played um, Big Daddy and Cat in the Hot Tim Roof. And it was like one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. I said, okay, how did you, how did you get there? And he goes, I learned my lines 10 weeks before. And it's like, all he'll ever talk about is learning your lines. And he talked about it so much with me. I thought, you know, I'm gonna try this. And then the last play I did, which was a year ago, I, learned my lines before we started rehearsal which is a real first for me and i i got much further in the play than i usually do i i was able to really really play with it like like having it like just it was putty in my hands i could i could try different things i wasn't afraid of anything because i just knew them backwards and forwards that I'm not the first person to say learn your lines, and I'm not the last, but I will say um, it really won't hurt you to know them a lot better than you even think you need to know them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very practical. It's true. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Sure. So let's, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I will ask this question, actually, and uh, this is not putting anybody on the spot, but it's interesting to me from a life and an acting life perspective. Uh, out of the out of the people at Yale in your uh, in your class, how many of them are still working and successful? Um, not that not that many. Um, we had a I we thought of ourselves as a dysfunctional class because we were the last class chosen by Robert Brewstein, and then when Lloyd Richards took over the school, he wasn't interested in us because he hadn't chosen us. So we were sort of orphans. And there was just something off, something toxic, something physically wrong happened to, to almost everybody. Somebody stepped off a curb and his leg broke. Another person was um, pistol whipped by a burglar. Another person got an, um, an immense ailment that nobody could figure out and went to the health services for a month and then came out again without any diagnosis, but got all better. Everybody had these weird physical things happen and we were all positive it was because something was not cursed about our class but just unhappy we had an unhappy class and people yeah. said to me you know how come you're not getting anything and i think and i said it's because i don't live in town i lived with my boyfriend a mile out of town and we had like a paper boy so we had this like weird suburban life that had nothing to do with this psycho drama school so okay. um what was the question again? Because I have I how forgot. many of them are still working? Okay, how many of them are still acting? Um, probably about five out of the fifteen. Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm not going to remember everybody's names, but uh, David Allen Greer is very famous and quite wonderful. Yeah. I I love him. Um, uh, Isabel Monk is a wonderful actor. She went to Minneapolis. And I think she's still there, but don't um, forgive me. I don't know. I haven't kept up with everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Steve Hendrickson, great Minneapolis actor, a stalwart, like leading man in Minneapolis. Um, I'm really bad at this. Uh, one of my best friends from drama school is Mitchell Lichtenstein, who 
kind of stopped acting after a while and started filmmaking. And he made the really great film Teeth, which is many people's favorite film. It's a dark comedy that I highly recommend. Teeth, T-E-E-T-H. Um, okay, I'll check it out. Um, I can't remember off the top of my oh, and um, um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure who else is working right now. Um, certainly, the class ahead of me and the class behind me had more people who stuck it out. I think we were just sort of the bastard child class, and it was a little harder to to keep going. Make it work. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's get to our lightning round and and uh, and wrap this up. Um, Excellent. You've been on a lot of projects, as we've mentioned. Um, if you have to pick one as your very favorite, can you do that? Which one would that be? There's one in theater and there's one in film. Um, the theater one would be Candide at the Goodman in Chicago. Hmm. Um, that's an incredible singing role. It was uh, Kuniganda in Candide. She gets to sing all these amazing songs and it was fabulous. And in film, on, on film, I would say probably the, this TV show that nobody ever saw is called um, Almost Grown. But, and it was written and, and created by David Chase, who ended up doing The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a really mysterious and complicated show about two people. The, it was me and Tim Daly. And we meet when we're 16 and we fall in love and get married when we're 25. And then by the time we're 38, we're divorced with two kids and we're really unhappy, but we still love each other. And every episode would start when we're 38. And then one of us would hear a rock and roll song and it would send our memory back to where we first heard that song. And we would be either 16 or 18 or 22 or 30 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I love that part for two reasons. One, it was really cool to be able to play all those ages and really, you know, I think we did a really great job playing 16 and 38. That's really hard to do. Yeah. And second, the writing was, I've never had writing that good. Of course, it was David Chase. Of course, he ended up doing The Sopranos. Of course, he ended up being the world's greatest TV writer. We didn't know that at the time. We just thought it, it was his first original show. And he was a darling person to work with. And it was just such complicated, nuanced writing that um, it was so inspiring and so so challenging. So that was great, but that only lasted like a year because yeah. it went on TV during the writer's strike, so it died quickly. Sorry, you mentioned writing. This is not part of the uh, part of you know my my question set, but I have to ask because I know that you did an episode of uh, Newsroom, which is one of my favorite uh, shows ever, and we're talking about Aaron Sorkin. So, how was writing there? And uh, again, you you uh, you had to play with uh, incredible people on that uh, on that show. Yeah, um, I the, the morning that I was, I only had one day. I had one one episode. Yep. I woke up and I was deathly ill. I was like throwing up, and I. I thought, what do I do now? And I tried calling the AD and they weren't picking up because it was four in the morning. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go there. And the one thing I know is when you have any kind of nausea, you should eat charcoal. You should burn. And one way you get charcoal is by burning a piece of bread until it's black and eating it. And I knew I would feel better if I did that. And so I made them give me that. And I made them made nobody come near me. But then they stuck me in a kind of a little cubby hole room where I just had a little pinhole, just like just like this, um, to talk yeah. to. I had to talk to Jeff Daniels as if I could see him, and all I could see was a, a green light. And um, everyone was really kind to me because they knew I was sick, but um, there's nothing they could do. If you'd seen the set, it was the most expensive and elaborate set I've, I've ever been on, period. It was magnificent. There was banks of monitors and all these fancy desks it was just fabulous a lot of fun and in my ear just like i have these these airpods on i in my ear i had jeff daniels who is the kindest most wonderful oh i'd say he might be one of my top three favorite people i've ever worked with and he knew i was sick but he he didn't make a fuss and 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 we were talking and in between 
takes, I would say, I'm having a hard time with these lines. And he would say, oh my God, isn't it the worst? It's just impossible. Oh my God. And he was just so kind. And yeah. I had to, and I had to just keep rattling off these very difficult lines. I, I did say at one point when Aaron gathered us with the director, all of us, to discuss the scene before we began shooting it. And he said, and Aaron said, does anybody have any questions about the lines or anything um, that's, that's popping for you, anything that's bothering you or anything? And I said, well, I have this one line where I go, what business what business does government have being in the religion business? I said, so that's saying business twice. Is that okay? And he goes, that was deliberate. And he was really icy and very pissed off that I asked the question. And I was like, oh, yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can't believe I made that rookie mistake. Um, so, Jeff Daniels, oh. best, best guy in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> speaking of another, you know, again, <clears throat> kind of uh, a running, a running in circles a little bit, but uh, did you ever intersect with, uh, with another wonderful person, Adam Glass, because you are on two of his projects that I, I saw right away, Cold Case and then uh, Supernatural. You know, he was a writer on Cold Case and then he was the executive producer and writer on Supernatural and you've done uh, episodes. Did you ever intersect with Adam? I bet you I have. I bet you I met him on the set and we shook hands and everything, but I, I, Probably only when I was rushing from makeup to the sets. I don't don't know him now. Got you. Um, on, cold, on Cold Case, I'll tell you, I remember Agnieszka Holland directed my episode. And mm -hmm. I remember at my audition, um, and I usually, sometimes I phoned in my auditions a little bit. I, I do not recommend this. But yeah. just to keep my sanity, sometimes I, I just don't give it everything. I don't live or die. Um, for this. So I came in for my cold case thing and I'm doing this scene. And after I was done, she said to me, I do not believe you. And I, <laughs> I was so shocked because in LA, you don't tell people that. You tell people, thank you very much. Yeah. And then you just don't get the job. But yeah. she was like yelling at me that she didn't believe me and it kind of woke me up. And so we did it again. And this time I tried and she goes, okay, that much better. And then she cast me. But it was, um, a little shocking, a little wonderful. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> yeah. um, you've mentioned Jeff Daniels, but uh, you know, who would you say is the best actor actor stuff uh, that you have ever worked with? Um, I'm going to say Armin Mueller Stahl. Um, he was in the movie Avalon, and I did not prepare this <laughs> answer. This just came flying out of my mouth when you asked. Only I because I, I I love. I, I love 60% of the actors I worked with. I think so yeah. many of the actors I've worked with are, I've just gotten so much out of them and they're phenomenal. Um, and they're all much better than I am. But Armin Mueller-Stahl was just, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong and I'm just swayed by his incredibly beautiful voice. Maybe it's not really magic, but all I know is I felt I was in the presence of greatness whenever I had a scene with him. I just felt like I wanted to pinch myself that I got to act with him. He was so effective, so beautiful, so completely disappeared inside the skin of his character. There's the movie Avalon by Barry Levinson, and he's the uh, star of it. He's the patriarch with uh, Elijah Wood as a young boy in his yeah. debut. and. Um, uh, Aidan Quinn plays his son and Elizabeth Perkins, his daughter-in-law. And it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful film, but he's, to this day, I, I will sometimes, like, I, I lift a window and the breeze comes in and I'll say, it's the breeze, it's the breeze, it's the breeze. He just, just little phrases he would say in that movie just, just um, blow me away. I think he was a big Fellini actor. Some, he's German mm -hmm. and he had a big career in Germany and then um, thank God uh, Barry Levinson cast him in this. It was an incredible performance. He's a great actor. Yeah. That's... There are a lot. There are many others. I mean, actually, I think Kevin Spacey was great. I know he's um, he's having a 
a very uh, yeah. terrible yeah. moment. Yeah. But I was in a, I played his wife in the movie Recount for HBO. And I felt like I was playing tennis with a really great tennis player because he wanted us to improv the scene instead of just do it as written. And so we started improving and, and he didn't make it easy, which was so much fun. He just kept being challenging and difficult. And I just thought that was so much fun. I thought, well, that was bracing. Um, mm -hmm. So he was a great actor, uh, but um, so many, so many great actors. Let me try to think. Um, Kevin, yeah, sorry for interrupting you, but Kevin is brilliant. Uh, uh, there, yeah. are, there are things to all of our lives that are less than perfect, and uh, some are really, really not uh, good. But in terms yeah. of, he's a brilliant, brilliant actor. Um, now, yeah. Yeah. What uh, what series or film that's out there right now that you are not in that you would have loved to be in? Oh my God, so many! Oh, you, that's too big of a question. Yeah, um, pick, pick one if you could. That's out there right now that I'd like to be yeah. in. Um, yeah. Oh my God, you know that I almost said Big Little Lies, and I am in Big Little Lies. Okay, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I would say I just want to I just want to play with there there's some shows I see and I go I go I just want to play with those people. I want to be in that too. Um yeah. like Better Call Saul is a show I love so much. Yeah. Uh I watch so much TV that this is all this answer isn't coming quickly to me. Um I think you know I really love Ryan Murphy and I've done two Ryan Murphy things, mm -hmm. but I wish I was in his stable of actors because they have so much fun and he does right by them and they do right by him. And I'm yeah. such a fan of every, of, of all the people in Pose, all the people in Pose and what he did in the show Pose of putting really experienced genius actors um, in with, brand new actors, trans men and trans women, and what it does to, to raise both of their games. So it's like a new kind of filmmaking. Um, I found Hollywood, the miniseries, just riveting with a mixture of acting styles and the, the way Ryan Murphy always goes for, um, goes for hope and love and kindness. Sometimes he can't stand giving his characters an unhappy ending. He just can't do it. And so he'll wrench a happy ending where maybe one dramatically um, uh, wouldn't necessarily be, but yeah. my heart just goes out to everything he does. So Glee was one of them and what was the other? You said you were in uh, two of the projects. I was. If if you um, recall, I'll look it up if then. You better look it up off the top, because I never worked with him or met. Oh, American Horror Story. Okay. I was exactly. in the first season of American Horror Story. Right. Um, and I'm right that Glee was was the other one, correct? I I want to make sure. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. want to leave that out there if I'm wrong. Okay. I used to be. I was so excited. I, I loved Glee so much. I can't even begin to say. And my the running joke in my family with my kids is, I would I would tell them that I would threaten to them that if I met any of their friends, I was going to say, "Hi, um, I'm Grace's mom. I was on Glee." That I was just going to constantly tell everybody I was on Glee, and I would, I would. That was a running joke in our family, and it still is because Glee is long gone, and we will often just say. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'd like to order a pizza and a salad. I was on Glee. Like yep. we will pretend that we're going to say that because it was just uh, crowd yeah. salsa. Um, I'm I'm a Glee. I'm proud. Uh, my my daughter uh, actually my daughter is rewatching it right now, and um, I I don't think she did it just because you know poor Naya um, uh, passed, but I, I think she just she wants to rewatch it. I've seen it. The whole show at least twice. I know my daughter has seen it at least twice. So now maybe this is the third time that she's rewatching it. 
it's um it's, yeah it's got some amazing stuff in it the day yeah. that i filmed my stuff um they tried to give me a really pretty hairdo and because i'm insane i told them to make it look drab because i figured since i was the mother of a quadriplegic that mm -hmm. i wouldn't have time to do my hair and so i said no no make me look really drab my agents don't like it that i do this sort of thing but i do this sort of thing a lot um at the end it was around two in the morning we had been filming all day and leah michelle's was starting to get sort a sore throat you know she had to sing live it was not recorded she did live sing over and over and over again she was being a real trooper but um it was getting late and it was a director who hadn't done a lot before and i could see him in the corner looking kind of despairing looking kind of worried and i knew we had this whole big scene to do and the and the line producer came over to say hi to me because he had been on my first TV show, uh, Almost Grown, the one I mentioned with David Chase. And he was really nice to me because he remembered me as the star of that show. And then I saw him walk over to the director and his body language looked like he was scolding that guy or threatening him, you know, making him feel bad about the incredible delays we were experiencing on the set. And I knew that the scene coming up could be done in 15 minutes because I've just been around so long. I, You ask any actor who's done enough, they know how to, do things where to put the camera and so on and i knew that this guy wasn't 100 percent sure i i knew what he was planning to set up he was setting up a close-up on me and then he'd turn around and have a close-up on mm. lee michelle and a close-up on cory monteith and so i walked over to him and i said hi and he goes hi and i said um you can tell me to fuck off and i really won't mind but i know how you can do this next scene in 15 minutes so please tell me I said, okay, you start with the camera over over me to Lee and Michelle, the door opens. And then when they walk in, you swing around, you watch, you follow me down the hall. So in other words, I told him how to do it, the yeah. handheld, you know, one shot. And what I was doing by telling him that was A, getting rid of most of my close-ups in the episode and B, getting rid of most of my overtime because we were now into golden time and I was getting like a couple hundred dollars every 15 minutes or something for all the overtime. But I'm also a mother. And when I see a young person in distress, like this director was over in the corner, also, you know, I long ago decided to do the right thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> if you can. So I went over and I told him how to do it really fast. And he said, okay, new deal, everybody. You've had a great, and I went, and he said, uh, okay, so we have a new idea. And he set up the new shot. It was done in 15 minutes. And I was out of there uh, in my car and driving home going, was that wise? <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, I got a handwritten thank you note from him saying, you saved my ass. And so it was a good thing. I was happy about that. But thank I'm you. not really that great in the show. I'm kind of drab looking and you don't get a lot of close-ups of me. My own mm -hmm. fault. Thank you for doing what's right anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm glad. <laughs> What's one thing most people do not know about you? Um, probably that I sing, um, but hmm. it doesn't matter. Um, what is one thing they don't know, know about? I know that for my research, I was actually, there was one of the questions I was going to do a little singing for you because I know that you're a singer and I am not, but uh, okay, so people don't know that you sing. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. I can't, there's so many things I'm sure people don't know, but they're okay. very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I find it, I'm gonna ask my last question in a minute, but I find it interesting that, you know, you are a historian uh, and a historian major and, uh, you know, your parents, uh, obviously one of them was. Uh, you get to play some really wonderful historic parts. And um, I, yes. I, I really kind of wanted to dive into all that, which we don't have time. But yeah, uh, so to to uh, keep keep it short, you were, uh, you know, Eliza. Uh, you were Eliza Hamilton um, in uh, <laughs> in in George Washington. Uh, you know, the uh, I think the founding of the nation, or what was it? Uh, the forging of the nation. I know I I've watched have, it. Yeah. I am so sorry. I may have to have you killed now. Yeah, I think so. Um, did that was did, so bad the the whole movie or the whole 
thing and my performance. Oh, I used to I used to have that on video tape and show my friends and we would just roar with laughter over how bad I was. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that answers why the the next part of the question. I was wondering if uh, you know Lynn uh, ever came by to ask some questions as he was writing Hamilton. Yeah. I don't understand why he doesn't need my insight. I had the little white mop cap and I did the little pause before I left. Oh, I, I hope he didn't watch George Washington the Forging the Nation before he before he it would have thrown him off by a year. I'm very glad he did what he did, which is read the book about it. Uh, on the on the off chance that he gets to watch this show, then <laughs> I think you might go back and rewatch. <laughs> Yeah, no, mm, not, please. I was so bad in that. It was like the second thing I ever did. Yeah. And I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. And it shows. Oh, so embarrassing. All right. Then let's let's fast forward five years from there. And you were Marilyn. Uh, yeah. So. My, a, my agents didn't want me to do that because they thought, you know, it's kind of tacky. They thought. And I said, I have enough classiness in my career I want to do some I want to play this because I all my life I'd been people would send me a postcard with a picture of Norma Jean Baker on it and say hey I saw a picture of you and I and I go yeah people say I look like her and then I read for actually the Jackie part I had brown hair at the time because I was dyed for something I think for the um I think for a movie I did with a second movie I did with Elijah Wood um where I played his mother and they wanted me to look like him, so I dyed my hair brown. Um, so my hair was brown, and I went in for the Jackie part, and they were just kind of staring at me. I should know now that when they stare at me in auditions and don't talk to me that I'm about to get an offer. So they offered me Marilyn. And I think it was A, wise of them, because people tell told me when I was young, you can't see it now, but when I was young that I looked like her. And I thought that was kind of important visionary of them and then I said I just really want to do this so I researched the hell out of it which was a good thing because then when we got to filming and I saw that the monologue they gave me for her deathbed when she's on the phone with Peter Lawford it was just a terribly written monologue so I said I think you really guys I said to the producer you have to make up your mind is she killing herself was she murdered or was it an accident but you can't have all three in one monologue just to make everybody happy you really have to make a choice and they and the producer actually said okay you write it and he didn't mean it in a mean way he just said okay would you please write it and i go uh, okay so i got all my research out and i just used phrases i know she had said in postcards or letters or conversations with people or i'd heard her say there's a wonderful interview um an audio interview with a life magazine uh reporter that was my most useful piece of research because she used her usual she used her real voice in that and her real voice sounded a whole lot like my real voice and then pictures of her without makeup on looked a whole lot like me because her whole look part of the reason she's so often imitated and there's so many drag acts with her is because it's it's mostly made of paint and wig anybody can do it mm -hmm. if you have the basic template of her nose and her chin you can do it and i had a close i had a close version of her face in my basic face so they were able to paint it on really easily and and get me the wig they were going to just get a wig from like kmart and i they didn't say kmart but they they were just going to get me a wig and i put into my contract that they had to do a wig by renata who was this great wig maker she did all of Cher's wigs and I just knew she was great and she got me a wig that was just so awesomely exactly Marilyn Monroe so I ended up physically looking like her enough and then I had fun playing with the voice but they only let me do one take because they thought it was just fine and I wanted to, I was just warming up so I think it could have been better but I was really really happy to do the job because it's really fun to play Marilyn Monroe. I mean, it was fun. When I wore the happy birthday to you, Mr. President, dress, mm -hmm. um, the producer asked for my autograph. He mm -hmm. knew I wasn't Marilyn Monroe, but he was like all freaking out or something. And I said, 
do you want me to sign as Eve or as Marilyn? <laughs> like, what is going on here? Mm. So yeah, I played Marilyn. I also played Shirley Jones, um, mm. which was a lot of fun. And I met her too, got a picture side by side with her. Wow. Um, I like doing imitations of people and I like doing real people. Um, I like doing it all. Well, if, uh, last question, if, um, if you had a chance to go back in time and uh, speak to uh, you, well, let's say right after the, uh, the conversation uh, that you had in the diner at the uh, second year of uh, Yale, and uh, give one bit of acting advice since you decided that acting now is going to be your thing, what would that advice be? Um, I would say uh, hmm. maybe go to Los Angeles sooner. <laughs> I would say, first I would say, hi, um, it's me in the future it's you i'm you i would say it's all going to work out it's going to be great relax be on the right track um it's very hard for actors to know what whether they're doing the right thing because we don't have any just way of knowing i mean there's only so many acting prizes and what are all the other actors who don't get the acting prizes supposed to think so you kind of have to just trust yourself a little bit. So I would go back in time and go, it's all gonna be fine, you're gonna work a lot, everything's gonna be great, you're gonna get married, you're gonna have kids, all those nice things. And um go to LA a little bit sooner so you can make a little more money, I think. Although mm -hmm. I really loved my years in New York and my years doing re re resident theater, like at the Goodman and the Guthrie and Seattle Rep and all those places. I love that. So no, I wouldn't say go to LA sooner. I think I did it. I think I did everything the way I was supposed to. Good. Oh, I know. I would say um, sell all your stock before the crash. And I, I would try to remember when the crash was. I really don't have a lot of acting advice for myself as young. It's just because I don't think, I think you just have to okay, experience it as it happens. One of the reasons I picked, picked acting instead of anything else as a career is that I didn't want to ever be bored. And the cool thing about acting is once you've really gotten it down how to be an ingenue, then you're too old for it. It's time to learn how to be the next character. But, well, you've really gotten down being 30 and now, oh, you're 35. And you just you keep growing and you keep finding out who you are and it all keeps changing and you're, never going to master it in the sense of there i did it i'm done i'm perfect it's such a work in progress like your life your life's a work in project pro your life is a work in progress and acting is a work in progress and it never ends and it's never boring eve um <laughs> it's been it's been remarkable it's it's uh <laughs> it's really really pleasure speaking with you i know that we can uh we can talk about all of your projects and we'd be here all day and night and uh, we'd still have a lot to talk about uh, i think thank you. you're right you are so easy to talk to and i'm so <laughs> flattered by your knowing all that stuff about my career that i have forgotten and it was a real pleasure to talk to you thank you so much and uh, thanks for everybody for sticking with us. Uh, if you are still sticking <laughs> with us after all of uh, the weird things that I talked about, um, and no, if, if at any point you think that during the show all I'm going to do is just ask questions, that's never going to happen. I will be talking as well. Uh, oh, it's good. A conversation. It's a conversation. So thank you, everybody. Um, we know you love acting as much as we do, and that's why we do this for you. Thank you. Thank you.